This, this next end game is a real fight. It was played in 1993 in Calicut, India, in the World Junior Championship. This was an incredible tournament, a real experience playing there, taking rig shots to every game. I had an amazing time. My opponent was a really talented young Indian player named Suresh Kumar, and it had been a tremendously hectic middle game. I attacked him, he got the queens off, we reached this end game, and I really wanted to win this game, it was an important one. So you're going to see a very, very tense struggle now. So we have to deal with the problems as they come up. Pretend you're involved in this game. Pretend you're in it yourself. He began with g5, attacking my bishop. I played bishop b8. So now I'm attacking his pawn structure. You'll notice, of course, that the b6 pawn is restrained by my a4 pawn. You'll also notice he has a passed e pawn. I have potentially a passed h pawn, which could be good. I have a queenside majority, which is to my advantage, because there are, it's away from his king. He has a kingside majority, which is away from my king. My king is a little closer to his e-pawn than his king is to my c-pawn. These are small differences. The position probably is roughly even. Here he made a mistake. He played the move a5. From the last example, you probably can tell that a6 was the correct move. Don't lock your pawns on the same square as your opponent's bishop. a6 has the potential of b5. The reason he didn't do this, I think, was because he didn't want to allow me to expand further with b4 and b5. But a5 was a mistake. So now what do you do? Activate the king. King d2. Here my opponent missed his chance to completely activate his own king. Ideally, he should stop my king from entering on the queen side by bringing his king to c6. King e7 to d7 to c6 could stop king d3 to c4 to b5. But he began his kingside play, f5. I played again with the king. You'll often see this between players who are at slightly different levels of endgame understanding. One guy understands how to use the king, while the other guy just tries to push his pawns very quickly. A central king is key. And now he played king f7. He realized he had to bring the king into the game. I began to expand on the queen side. I played c3. We can feel how double-edged this fight is. I'm trying to play b4, take it, make a c-pawn passed. I'm trying to push on the queen side. He's trying to push on the king side. He played bishop e7. Now, I could have stopped his idea of king f6 by playing bishop e5, but it was unnecessary, because if he tries to play king f6, then I can play king d4, and there's no way for him to stop bishop e5 check. There was no reason for me to prevent his move. So now he wants to activate his bishop by playing bishop c5. And I played a very strong central move, bishop e5. Notice, of course, that his last move stopped me from playing b2 to b4. I played bishop e5, partially covering the f6 square, keeping his king passive, but also preparing bishop d4 to attack his weakness and push his bishop back to passivity again. After bishop e5, he played king g6. He has the right idea, play with an active king, but notice about the central king. My king is in the middle of the board, and his king has been relegated to the side. A huge theme to my play was keeping his king under wraps, keeping it locked down. I played bishop d4, attacking the b6 pawn. He has to defend it. Bishop d8. All of my moves are partially aimed at attacking weaknesses, partially aimed at expanding on the queen side, but also aimed at keeping his pieces passive. His king now is on the side of the board. His bishop is defending from d8 as opposed to c5. Now we repeated the position. I'm not convinced that I've played the correct move. I played bishop e5, stopping bishop c7 to attack my pawn, allowing his bishop back out, knowing I can always go back. What was coming into play at this point in the game was time pressure. We were on the 34th move. We were both nearing time pressure. And in fact, an amazing thing happened at the tournament. There was some kind of minor earthquake right where it was played. And all the lights in the tournament hall went out. It was an amazing moment because we were nearing time pressure. And all the players were looking around. The clocks weren't stopped. And this was a very important competitive moment because you're playing the World Championship. You're in India in this incredible playing environment where the lights go out. And you have to keep on trekking. So we repeated. Bishop e5 passing the move on to him, trying to get to the 40th move. It will have a new hour. He played bishop e7. Let me just discuss for a moment the psychology of time pressure. This is very, very important. Many players try to avoid making big decisions when they have a few moves left to go before time control. Because in most tournaments, once you reach the 40th move, you get another hour for your next 20 moves, or for the rest of the game. But a lot of the time, avoiding big decisions can be a critical mistake because you miss your moment and your advantage slips away or your defense slips away. So sometimes you should not make critical decisions in time pressure if you can maintain control of the position and you're better 
and you feel as if you can take critical decisions into a more solid moment. But sometimes, if you're worse, you want the game to reach its crisis when you're in time pressure because that lack of order can turn things around. And also, even when you're pressing for an advantage, you have to sometimes be brave and make the critical decision on leaving the 40th move. This has happened in my games quite a few times when I was forced to make a big decision on the last move of time control with just seconds on the clock. So now I missed my chance. I should have played bishop c7, bishop c5, and now the tactical move b4. Very, very important. After a takes b4, c takes b4, bishop takes b4, I can play bishop takes b6. I control both of the squares of my a-pawn that his bishop can potentially touch. His king is too far away, and I can push the pawn up the board. b4 would have won the game. But we were nearing time pressure, and I didn't see it in time. Notice that the key to that tactic is his king being far away from the action. I played the move b3, a waiting move. I had to calculate things out, didn't have any time on the clock. Now he played bishop c5, activated his bishop. I lost a moment, I had a good chance, missed it. And here I did another dangerous thing, I played h3. I made a very committal move on the king side in the time scramble. This is dangerous. What I was trying to do was set up a blockade for his king. I knew his king wanted to come up to h5 and g4. I had the idea of playing h3 and g3 to stop his king from going. But this exposed my pawns somewhat to his pushing his pawns here and creating a quick passer. Very dangerous decisions I made. I'm not sure that they were correct. They were made in the time pressure and this was a competitive moment more than a perfect moment. h3, played king h5, and I played g3, setting up that wall. Now we reach a really tense moment. This is move 37 for him. He has three moves to go, I have two. He played king g6. I played king c4. Now I'm really starting to go, b4. I managed to hold back his pawns. He played bishop e3. This is what endgames are really about. It's very rare that you'll play a perfect endgame. Endgames are about the fight. He started to come on the king's side. I stopped him. I took a risk, just barely stopped him. I missed a chance to go on the queen's side. I could have gotten a pass pawn really quickly. I missed it. Now I've got the initiative again. I have two moves left in time pressure. What should I do? I felt that I had turned things around, so I just repeated once. I played king d3. He went back to c5. I went king c4. He played bishop e3. Sometimes it's good to repeat moves in order to get closer to the time pressure. Don't repeat three times, because then it's a draw. Threefold repetition. And now I began b4. I broke through on the queen side. He immediately responded on the king side. f4. An endgame of attack and counterattack. Compared to the last bishop endgame against Bengston, where I had a dominant position, and I pushed him back, this game has a very different character. I'm attacking on one side, he's attacking on another side. It's almost like a Sicilian, in which I'm attacking his king on one side, he's attacking my king on the other with all the pieces. The endgame can be very exciting. And here's a critical moment. What should white do? We see that his f-pawn is very dangerous. It's protected. I obviously can't take it twice. He wants to play f3, f2, f1, make a queen. I have to decide whether I'm going to play g4 to lock his king out, which is very tempting. Believe me, I wanted to do it. Because if I play g4, his king can never get in. The f5 square and h5 squares are covered. The f6 squares cover my bishop. There's nothing he can do. If he plays f3, I play king back to d3. But there was a big trap in the position. If I had played g4, he could have made my life tremendously difficult with a tactic. What do you see? What I was nervous about was the move b5 check. This might look bizarre, but remember, the key to my position, if he plays f3, is to play my king back to d3. And then when he ever goes to f2, I play king back to e2, I can defend it with my king. If I had played g4 and he had played b5 check, if king takes b5, then f3, the king can't get back anymore. I would have to play bishop g3. And then we'd have to deal with f2, bishop takes f2, bishop takes f2, and the question as to whether my pawns would go faster than his e-pawn, things would be completely crazy and unclear. If after b5, I were to take with the a-pawn, then he would have a passed a-pawn himself. He'd play a4. And suddenly I have to deal with two things. The a3, a2, a1 threat, the f3, f2, f1 threat, things suddenly get very, very complicated. I didn't want to allow that to happen. Always watch out for these traps. The end game is full of them. I avoided that. I played b takes a5. 
He played b takes a5, and now I play g4. Whether or not b5 was good for him isn't really relevant. The point is that it would have been very complicating, and I have an advantage, so there's no reason for me to do that. I played a simple move, stopped his complex idea, and then paralyzed his king. Notice the theme in this endgame. I'm keeping his king out of the game. His king is stuck on g6, it's paralyzed there. Active king versus inactive king. We both have passed pawns, not just me. In fact, he has two passed pawns, the f pawn and the e pawn. The main difference is the king. He pushed, f3. I had to come back and defend, king d3. Attacking his bishop, if he plays f2, I can play king e2 and stop it. He played bishop f4, offered a trade of bishops. And here I decided to go after his a5 pawn. He played very cleverly. He's a very talented player, as you can feel. His moves have great strength. He's playing very actively and very strongly. So now he's mobilized his kingside pawns. His king still isn't active, although the f6 square will be coming to his control soon, and I have to go on the queen side. I played bishop d4. He played bishop g3, preparing to play f2, and he can still play e5 and e4 soon. I played bishop b6. Now I'm attacking his a5 pawn, and I'm preparing to move with my c pawn. Now he started to go, e5. And here I made a critical decision. I decided that my king could stop his pawns. And I played the move bishop takes a5, preparing an outside pass pawn that would be very hard to stop for him. If he plays f2, I could play king e2, defending the f1 square. And here we see, of course, the weakness of a bishop in the endgame. If he only has a dark square bishop, there's no way to defend the light squares. So usually when you're advancing pawns in bishop endgames, you advance them on the opposite color of your bishop. So that way you can control both the light squares with the pawn, for instance, and the dark squares with the bishop. Or the light squares with the bishop and the dark squares with the pawn. Keep that in mind. If he plays f2, then I can blockade. If he pushes his pawns on light squares, then he can control everything. After bishop takes a5, he played e4 check. His point is obviously that if king takes e4, he wins immediately with f2. My idea was king e3. Once again, we see that the main difference in this position is that I'm playing with my king and his king is doing nothing. The active king in the endgame is critical. So again, if he plays f2, I go back and defend. If he plays bishop f4 check, then I go back again. And what we see is that my king can control his pawns, because if the e pawn ever goes up check, then I can take the f pawn with a blockade. The only hope would be for him to check me on the long diagonal. So if he tries bishop d6, threatening bishop c5 check, if he gets that check in, I could be in trouble. But now I could play bishop b6 and stop it. I control the diagonal, and then my a pawn will fly. Precise calculation was necessary. Here he realized that the bishop and pawns couldn't do the work alone, so he tried to bring in his king, king f6. But I wouldn't let him. Bishop d8 check. I forced him right back. If he had played king e6, then I would have simply taken the pawn. Bishop takes g5, and now I would have had four pawns to do with an a pawn and an h pawn pass, both of which are very hard to handle, not to mention the c and g pawns. This would be winning. After bishop d8 check, he had to go back to the defense, king g6. And now I set up my optimum position. I played bishop b6. He played king f6. I played a5. And now he tried a trick. He played bishop h2. Because if I play a6, then he could play bishop g1 check, followed by bishop takes, a skewer. Of course, I wasn't going to fall for that. The difference now is that he doesn't control the f2 square with his bishop, so I can take the pawn. I just played king takes e4, the f3 pawn is gone, and he resigned. And I win. So the key to this endgame was my king. Remember this. Bishop endgames, knight endgames, rook endgames, an active king is essential. Here he was locked out of the play, and in a very fierce double-edged game, what gave me the advantage was the fact that I was playing with one large weapon that he was playing without, my king. In the middle game, you should defend him, protect him. In the end game, use him actively.